um, pretty much asymptotic analysis, which if you've never heard about it, it's pretty much looking at the growth rate of different functions as they approach some point. Um, and that's really useful for algorithms um, when it comes to the amount of resources that they use. So here on the screen is a little big O cheat sheet that I found that has a bunch of nice stuff on it. Um, I can send this to anyone who wants it afterwards or you can just look it up. It's pretty nice. It has all the pretty popular. I know it's small, but uh, on the screen, but it has all the good sorting and searching algorithms as well as data structures. So if you wanted to look at that, um, feel free. So let's get started without further ado. There we go. So the topic layout, again, for the night is going to be our motivation. You know, why should we bother learning this? Um, asymptotic analysis, which is really the foundation for analyzing algorithms. Uh, the applications of asymptotic analysis, time and space complexity, uh, a little bit of a deeper dive into time complexity, also a little bit of a deeper dive into space complexity, how they tend to interact with each other in the real world, and um, um, then I'll look at some well-known algorithms, analysis of, the, of these examples, and then a uh, closing and conclusion of the workshop. Also, if you have any questions during the workshop, just please let me know. I'm kind of just here to, you know, work out anything that you guys might have uh, interest in or, you know, questions about. So feel free to stop me at any time. So motivation. You know, a question that we should ask about the analysis of algorithms or algorithms in general um, is, is why do we care about them, right? Um, this is a good question to ask. And to put it simply, you know, it's a really important topic, actually, to uh, be able to at least understand at a high level, right? You know, as human beings, we have a limited amount of resources. Um, you know, for example, you know, take food and water. If I, if I wanted to have food or I needed to feed a whole, you know, family or something, I can't just make food appear out of thin air. I have to put in resources to produce those resources, right? Um, algorithms are no different. Um, for an algorithm to run, it needs a certain amount of time to run effectively. Uh, it also needs a certain amount of space to run effectively, uh, i.e. In the, in the scheme of computers in each memory, right? So these are important things to think about uh, when considering different algorithms. You know, for example, um, take, I know I'll put on the slide, a, a small company that's trying to make some kind of application. Or, you know, if a company's trying to make an application and they're trying to serve uh, pretty much clients in their application development, if they have an algorithm for kind of maybe storing and retrieving user information, you know, if that algorithm takes 20 years to run, no one's going to use it, right? Or maybe another algorithm uh, that maybe a weather station uses or, or maybe a meteorologist would use to predict weather for the next week. Again, if it takes like, you know, 10 years to run, you know, no one's going to care about it. It's not viable. Uh, similar thing for space, right? Maybe I made a faster algorithm. Uh, but maybe I need, you know, like a terabyte of, you know, RAM to actually use it. You know, these are extreme examples, but you just kind of drive home the fact that these are things that we need to consider uh, when we are designing algorithms and when we're analyzing them. You know, it might not be the most fun thing, but it's something that's necessary if you're going to develop these things. And uh, here is the famous meme that they always have uh, uh, <laughs> Windows back in the day taking like 40 years to <laughs> saying that it needed a... 40 more years to load. Uh, I, I noticed something when I was looking at it. I think it's at Netscape in this picture somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From ftp.netscape.com. I thought that was funny. So asymptotic analysis, moving on. Um, what is asymptotic analysis, right? So uh, in mathematics, asymptotic analysis, also known as asymptotics, which is kind of just a uh, shorthand way of saying it, is a method of describing the limiting behavior um, of a function or or more specifically how a function behaves as it approaches some point uh n right or n star i put as um as a point when we're talking about algorithms um we're going to take this n to be um non-negative right it could be zero or positive but that's not the case in mathematics um in mathematics it could pretty much head you know to any of the we're talking about real numbers, any of the real numbers, but 
for algorithms, say we're using n as a denote, uh, denote like a denoter for input, right, um, or input size, we're not going to be having negative inputs. So for algorithms and computer science, um, we're going to be talking about non-negative m. So why do we apply asymptotic analysis to algorithms? Well, we apply it to kind of get a sense of their performance based on these different inputs, right? Uh, usually an algorithm, not all algorithms, some of them can be constant depending on the uh, input that they take in. But, you know, a decent amount of algorithms, the larger the input that you take in or the more complex input, these algorithms are dependent upon the size of that input. And they use their resources differently depending on that size. So asymptotic analysis uh, enables us to kind of explicitly compare and define these growth rates of uh, performance for algorithms so that we can kind of put them in a better frame and say, okay, well, for this given size, as it approaches this given size, maybe this algorithm would be more efficient to use rather than this one. Or maybe this one uses different resources than the other one. So it, it's definitely a good thing to look at and it gives us the ability to kind of compare and pick what's best for our needs. So now that we've talked and, and gave a little introduction on Big O, um, or sorry, <laughs> though we've given a introduction on asymptotic analysis, we're going to talk about three of the big um, things that denote uh, growth rate in, in asymptotics, uh, which are Big O, Big Omega, and Big Theta. Big Omega, if you guys have ever taken a class like, you know, 213 or 403, which is um, data structures and analysis of algorithms respectively, you may have seen some of these terms. So when analyzing functions with asymptotic analysis, uh, we classify their growth rates using these symbols. Um, and here I have these expressions that are kind of laid out for two given functions, two you know, randomly chosen functions, fn, uh, f of n and g of n. So we say that f of n is going to equal big O of g of n when uh, we say that g of n is big O of f of n. Uh, similarly, we say f of n is big omega of g of n when uh, g of n is big omega of f of n. And then finally, we say that uh, f of n equals big theta of g of n, and also this implies that g of n equals big theta of f of n. Um, so what do these things really mean, right? And um, I have said that they kind of define growth rates, but let's, let's get into a little bit what they mean with starting with big O. So big O, I know that's a little bit mathy here, but uh, I guess we can get into it. I'll try to explain a little bit of the um, the mathematics here because it's a little bit dense. But we say that the function f of n equals big O of g of n if for values greater than or equal to some n that's greater than our initial value n not. Uh, zero is less than or equal to f of n is less than or equal to a constant c times g of n. So what does this really mean? Well, what this means is that we can choose a function that pretty much when multiplied by a constant at a certain point that is less than or, or greater than or equal to our initial value of n is always going to be larger at that point. So I noticed in the picture too, I actually mixed this up. Um, this actually denotes a different property. Imagine if these guys um, were switched, right? In places of f of n, this is c, g of n, and f of n was here. So I have an example here that pretty much says, uh, take f of n equal to 5n, and then g of n equal to n. And I just said, let's take our uh, n not equal to 1 and our constant uh, c equals 10. We can see that for values uh, for n greater than n not, n greater than 1 in this case, we can see that 0 is less than or equal to 5n, which is less than or equal to 10 times n. Therefore, mathematically, I'm not going to get into kind of the mathematical rigor for this, it's always going to be the case that f of n uh, equals big O of g of n when n is sufficiently larger than or equal to 1. So let's actually graph this example so you guys can actually see what I'm talking about here. So 
I actually got to open up Desmos calculator. Uh, if no one uses Desmos, it's really fun. So let me use it. So I said y, or let's let's denote. Yeah, that's fine. Y equals five n, and then I'm going to denote another expression, and I'm going to say y equals ten n. Right. So if we zoom in a little bit, we can see this trait for um, y equals to ten n here that I used in the example, and then y equals to five n. We can see that as we're increasing uh, for x values, the growth rate of uh, y equals 10 n, which is our g of x multiplied by the constant 10, is always higher than this y equals 5 n. Therefore, we can say that, okay, for you know n larger than the n that we chose, which we chose 1, um, it is the case that you know all positive positive values, this is, this is the case, but uh, or not negative rather. But we can pretty much say, okay, we found a, a good bound in terms of big O uh, for this um, for this function. So let me go back to the slide. Okay. So the next example will be uh, big omega. So we say that a function f of n equals big omega of g of n if for values n greater than or equal to our n, so not again, um, this c, this constant times g of n, is less than or equal to f of n. Um, I apologize for that c times f of n. That's actually a mistake. It's just supposed to be f of n. So this whole idea um, is that f of n, regardless of what we multiply, uh, what regardless of what constant we multiply g of n by, for all n not greater than or equal to n, and again, it, it's going to be larger than c times g of n. And this implies a different um, magnitude of growth or a growth factor, which um, when I say growth factor, you can think of it as kind of meaning, um, for example, if we have a function f of n equals n, right? And then we have another function g of n equals you know, n squared, um, that g of n is, has a larger growth factor of f of n because it's raised to the second power. Just as, you know, um, you know, if I had another function, maybe k of n, that was like n factorial, that's a much larger growth factor than either of those, right? So we have those, that idea of the growth factor here. And uh, for this example, we could see, okay, take f of n equal to n squared and g of n equal to n. Um, and then I just said, let's take n not equal to 4, because pretty much the whole idea of picking n for these problems is just getting n small enough uh, that you can actually prove it. And then c equal to 10. And then when we uh, have the equal uh, equality for um, all n greater than or equal to 4, we can see that the inequality is true, and therefore we can say that f of n equals big omega of g of n. So again, to better understand this relationship, let's uh, let's graph this inequality. So we had y equal to n, and then, or we had y equal to 10n, I apologize, because we had a constant, and then y is equal to n squared. So you can see for large enough values, this one we actually have to zoom out a little bit because we actually have to get it to that point. Um, you can see that for large enough values of n, we're kind of going here, 10 times n is sufficiently larger, and then there's a point where, um, I think this is actually n equals 10, that pretty much uh, n squared surpasses it. And pretty much if I zoom out, um, you can kind of see, if I go to the top here, you can see that relationship that, yeah, the larger and larger I get for the n values, you can see that this is totally just surpassed, right? So pretty much the whole point is, if I were to take this limit, for example, as n were to go to infinity, right? I was getting larger and larger. Um, you know, the value of y equals n squared would be much, much larger than y equals to 10n. And that is sufficient to prove uh, big omega for this case. So if I go back to the PowerPoint, sorry, it seems I got out of this. There we go. So that is uh, big omega. Well, let's move on finally to big theta, which is, I don't know why this state constant. I apologize for the pictures. 
they must have gotten duplicated when I was moving them. But in any case, um, big theta. We say that a function f of n equals theta of g of n, and as well, this implies that g of n equals big theta of f of n, if for values, again, n greater than or equal to n naught, you have these two constants, these two positive constants, c1, c2, such that 0 is less than or equal to c1 times g of n, which is less than or equal to f of n times c2 or g of, or, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be a multiplication. That's supposed to be another less than or equal to sign. Again, I apologize for that. Um, again, where c2 and c1 are positive constants, such that c1 is less than or equal to c2, and n0 is some initial value for n, which this expression is true. Again, I imply that this means uh, th this works for uh, both ways. So pretty much if f of n equals theta big theta g of n, uh, goes the other way, g of n equals big theta of f of n. And uh, this means that we really have this bounded, uh, these bounded functions that are kind of bounded by these functions multiplied by each other. Um, I wanted to do a written example for this question because I thought it would be better just to kind of uh, show you guys uh, in a written way kind of how this would be done. So I'm going to go to OneNote, and here I have given myself two functions that I am going to try to prove if I can get my pen rather than my eraser. Prove that f of n equals um, big theta g of n and g of n equals two big theta of f of n. So if I didn't say so before, this is actually just proving that uh, our f of n is equal to big omega of g of n, and that f of n is equal to big O of g of n. So pretty much, we just have to prove both ways, and then we get this big theta. So let's do, let's do big O, right? And remember, what did we have for big O? For big O, we had n greater than or equal to some n naught, such that zero is less than or equal to uh, f of n is less than or equal to c1 times g of n, where c is greater than zero. So my functions, I have n squared and 3n squared. Let me pick... I don't know. Uh, we can already kind of see that g of n is bigger than f of n, so I could just pick my constant to be 1. Uh, so c equals 1. And then let me pick my n to be 1, too, because this is going to be a pretty easy one to prove big O for. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit. So what I have to do is pretty much test that this is the case. So I have 0 is less than my f of n, which at point 1 is just going to be you know, uh, one squared is less than or equal to this one uh, times my three of n squared. And we can see that this is obviously the case, and zero is less than or equal to one, which is less than or equal to three. And therefore, by asymptotic analysis for a definition for big O, we've proved, we've proved this, that f of n, this symbol with the three dots means therefore. Okay, so now we have another problem, which is to prove um, big omega, right? And for big omega, we have a similar definition, but kind of flipped, right? So we have to prove that zero is less than to equal, I'm sorry, one second. We have that n for n greater than some n naught we have that zero is less than or equal to some c times g of n is less than or equal to f of n, which pretty means no matter what, again, whatever we multiply g by, the f of n is always going to be greater. So for this one, since we have, again, f of n equal to n squared, g of n equals to 3n squared, uh, for the c, I am going to take... Um, let's take, I don't know, uh, 10, right? C equal 
times 10. And let's take n equal to, uh, let's take n equal to 2. Again, you can kind of pick these constants and just kind of see where the relationship is going to lead you into uh, a, a true inequality when that actually holds. So I have 0 is less than or equal to 10 times 2. Uh, that's going to be 6, uh, which is less than or equal to... Oh, sorry. Did I do that wrong? You know what? <laughs> Let me find. Let me do n equals one. I just noticed that that's going to be incorrect. And uh, oh, you know what? I did this. Wrong. My bad. You know what? I want to choose a very small m. My mistake. A very small c rather. So if I do that, that should hold. Yeah, yeah, that should hold definitely. Okay. So there we have this one tenth times 3 times 1 squared, right? Which is just going to be 3 times 3 times 1. And then we're going to have 1 squared here, which is true that this 3 tenths is less than or equal to 1, right? So therefore, we have proved uh, f of n is equal to big omega of g of n. And by what we have stated prior, this means that f of n equals big theta of g of n. And this also implies that g of n equals big theta of f of n, right? So we've had that proven. Oops, sorry, I kind of scrolled back there after. But yeah, so pretty much we have that kind of found out. So, um, I want to play a bit, a little bit of, of a video now um, that kind of talks about these concepts a bit further. So, I'm going to play this video. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, and I think it kind of uh, comes out with these ideas a, a bit more in depth. So, let's, let's go ahead and play that. Also, let me know if the sound is okay for you guys. Okay, so for this video today, we are going to have a discussion about asymptotic bounding and, and bounding the asymptotic nature of our functions. So I always say things like O of n or n squared, but what do I really mean? I, I kind of addressed this in another video where I talked about what uh, asymptotic functions actually mean and what these boundaries mean, but I think it's time to go very deep into this topic and get very detailed and mathematically rigorous about what I'm actually saying. So before I continue on, if you have not subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel and like for preparing for interviews. And first, let's look at our most common bound, which is the upper bound, which is the big O bound. And we're going to look at the mathematical understanding behind it. And I will make it as simple as possible so that we can really understand what we're actually saying when I say big O of N. So, okay. The way that asymptotic bounds work, and the way you really should think about this, is every time you have a piece of code or you have an algorithm, it requires resources. These resources come in the form of taking up time or taking up space. And our job is to analyze how much time and space does this algorithm take, because that is of interest to us. The more we can understand how an algorithm behaves, the better we can optimize it, see where its flaws are, see where we can improve things, and we can improve its asymptotic uh, nature. So first of all, I keep saying the word asymptotic. What does that mean? So asymptotic, as you probably are familiar with the concept of asymptotes, is the nature of a graph or a nature of a function as it reaches a, a untouchable bound, as it reaches a very large value, it, it approaches a certain value, right? So it's about the nature for ends that are arbitrarily large that are very, very, very large beyond what you could even imagine because when we see how a function behaves on the tail end, on the asymptotic end, that is when we have a true understanding of its performance because some algorithms might run faster initially. We might have a curve running like that and then we might have a line running like that. Initially, the curve is faster or slower, but 
on the tail end is when we see who really wins. So enough talking about this. Let's see an actual definition. So first, what we need to see is we need to understand the work we're doing. So let's define a function. It's normally called T of n for the work that our function does. Okay, so we have T of n right there. So this is the either the time or the space a function takes as n changes. Do you see how n is the parameter to the function? As we modulate n, I can move n up or I can move n down. When I do that, the output, the output of that function changes. And our job is to bound the change in that function, bound the possibility of how this function can change as n gets very large. So you'll see what I mean. We have our function of how things change versus how we modulate n. So now what we need to do is establish the definition for big O. And we'll get into the other bounds, but let's just look at big O, which is the upper bound. Okay, so let's look at the rigorous mathematical... I also want to make a note that uh, we're going to be talking a decent amount uh, in application to algorithms uh, about big O. So this is the part of the video that I want to show. Uh, since big O is the worst case for an algorithm, pretty much the worst case when it comes to time or space or whatever else you're measuring, of course, time and space are usually two ones really look at alone but um you're really gonna look at this this big o this worst case upper bound that you want to make sure your algorithm uh runs you know faster or less uh memory intensive than definition for big o which is an upper bound it's upper bounding work so let's read this verbatim and see what it means see if it makes any sense t of n is bounded upper bounded by f of n if and only if T of n is less than or equal to some constant c times f of n, the function we chose to bound with, for all n greater than the initial n or n naught. So this this does this make sense? To me, it really doesn't make sense. This is the definition that we get in our introductory classes. This is the definition we get when we first learn it. And this is this is too thick for me to understand. So why don't we break it down and really see what this is suggesting to us. So first, what this is actually saying to us, what it, it's proposing is we have a certain amount of work. We're doing a certain amount of work given by the function t of n. That's our actual graph. That's the actual work the algorithm does. We want to bound it. We want to put a bound over it, a cover over it, and we'll see what that looks like using a function called f of n. So we say t of n can be upper bounded, big O, upper bounded, by f of n. And what are the conditions? How do we know that f of n satisfies? How do we know that f of n can upper bound us? Okay, are you still with me? So we only can declare this is true if and only if this is true. The function that we have, if we multiply our bounding function, f of n, by some constant, we will be able to always, always, always keep t of n under our bounding function. So let me show you. This is an example, and this doesn't need to make sense right now, but it will make sense once I do this example. So our job is to choose a C so that F of N bounds T of N, our actual work. So let's let's do a bounding right now so you see exactly what I mean. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore bounding. We're gonna do and try to satisfy what that guy just told us. So here's T of N, here's our function. And what I want to do is I want to choose a class of functions. We know our class of functions of how we can bound. Well, we'll become familiar with them over time, but we want to bound this somehow. So why don't I start with trying to bound this? So let me define a function that might bound this. Maybe it might bound it, maybe it might not. Let's try it right now. Okay, so here is our function t of n, and I made a random choice. I said, I want to try to bound with n squared. So our function we want to try to bound or work with is n squared. So we see n squared. This is the raw function of n squared multiplied by t being 1. Okay, so what we're doing is c times our function is going to be the result of the function we're trying to bound with. Stay with me. This will make sense in a little. And now here is the critical, critical point. Am I able to modulate this base function of n squared so that for all values of a constant I need to find, 
this T of N stays under it. So why don't we go crazy? Why don't we turn C and it turns C to 100? And now let me change our graph. Okay, and now is this true? If I take all N values on this axis and I go from N dot, which might be zero, all the way to the end, far, far, far away, will T of N always stay below this function? And what you see here is it looks like it will. This guy's diverging off to here. He's going to stay linear. And what we see is this is a correct bounding. This is an upper bound. We have satisfied the rules that Big O imposed on us because we found our constant. We found a constant C that keeps T of N below the bounding function. What is the bounding function? The bounding function is n squared. So what can I declare right now? So what I can now declare is that this function is upper bounded by n squared. As long as I can choose some multiple c, I just proved I can choose a, a multiple c that will keep this function t of n below me at all time. But Okay, so that's all I wanted to show about the video. I know videos can be a little bit dry sometimes, especially about... Some of this material, but uh, thanks for thanks for bearing with me. So what he was really saying um, in that video was he, he was kind of walking through the um, idea that I had kind of showed before um, when I was working with. If we go back to Big O, right? He used a a uh, a quadratic argument where he he really took um, a function, you know, n squared, and took some linear function. And multiplied the quadratic function as a constant, and he totally outgrew it. The idea is the same, right? If I have an algorithm that, you know, based on its size n, you know, um, maybe it's dependent on n such that you know the function increases, you know, uh, quadratically, um, you know, I, I want to be maybe I don't know that, right? But maybe I say, hey, maybe I'll try to bound it by n cubed, right? Maybe try to make it bound big O by by the cube. And um, I'll take a look at that, and then I would see that, yeah, it's uh, it seems to be bounded. Um, and maybe I could even find a better bound for that. Um, in the case of n squared to n cubed, I don't think we can really get that much better from there. But there are cases where maybe sometimes, for example, if I said, okay, well, you know, a function that has, uh, you know, uh, some complexity of n squared, I can bound that upper bound that by, you know, n factorial. It's like, well, yeah, I can, but... That's a huge, like very, very loose bound. And loose being in the sense of, yeah, there's a bound there, but n factorial outgrows that limit. Like, it's obvious. It's not really telling us much, right? So we want to make that bound as close to n squared as possible without, you know, while still actually keeping it bounded. So um, it, it's our job to kind of find tight bounds. And that's kind of what the whole idea of picking C and picking n kind of tries to do in this, in this strategy, in this, uh, in this way of picking them. So I'm going to move on back to our slide. And I'm going to talk about the applications of asymptotic analysis, which uh, the video talked about, which was time and space complexity. So now that we know the asymptotic, what an asymptotic analysis is, how do we apply it to algorithms? Um, instead of talking about an arbitrary, you know, size n being translated to some complexity, let's talk about time and space complexity, right? So time complex, space complexity are, you know, the two really big things you want to look at when developing an algorithm. You want to say, okay, can I develop an algorithm that takes a shorter amount of time to run based on the size of the input? Uh, can I compare it with another algorithm that maybe performs uh, well at a lower level, but just kind of, you know, increases uh, exponentially when it kind of gets with, the, kind of has a bigger output. So um, we can really pick what algorithm we need for the job and make a judgment call kind of, you know, on, oh, can I pick this algorithm because it has a lower time? Maybe I'll pick this one that has more space, but it has less time. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a judgment call in that way. So here is the uh, kind of chart that was shown for a, um, for the, uh, from, from the video, sorry. And uh, these are kind of classes of big O. And again, I said big O is what we're really going to be working with when it comes to uh, measuring complexities. So pretty much we have our O of 1, which is a constant time, which means we have no relation to the input size uh, when it comes to our algorithmic uh, 
when it comes to our algorithm running, right? Um, and I, I think a big uh, misconception with this O of one is that it takes some like one unit of time or something to run. All that O of n means is, you know, I can have an algorithm that takes in maybe 10 elements from like an array, right? Or I could have it take it in a million elements from an array. The time that it's going to take is not dependent on n. So it's going to take the same amount of time as it would for 10 elements for a million elements. That's all that O of 1 means. just means it is constant. Again, um, going further on, log of n, big O of log of n, um, again, logarithm. I'll talk about that in algebra and short calculus a bunch of times. But uh, here, uh, usually with computers uh, and algorithms, we'll use log of base 2. Um, it's interesting to note that as you go to infinity, the log doesn't really matter because, again, it's kind of treated like a constant, really. Uh, technically, it is a constant, but we, this is beyond the scope of this. Pretty much the log doesn't matter as we kind of go to higher and higher limits, but usually just a good note for it is, uh, you know, we have complexity of, of log of n. So I, I think a good one to kind of introduce for log of n is uh, searching from a binary tree, right? If I wanted to find an element in a binary tree, uh, but, you know, of course, assuming that it's, you know, binary search tree, which is like complete and not complete, but uh, is actually ordered correctly, right? Um, I'm splitting my search space in half each time. And that's what really log base two of n is doing. Um, so that would be an example of an algorithm that's bounded by O log of n. Uh, linear is pretty much just increases linearly with n. If I had to do this, I could think of O of n. Uh, if you want to search um, through a sorted list, right, um, of numbers, if you wanted to just iterate until you found a number, um, you could do that. Um, it's kind of just, you know, an example of an algorithm. Quadratic uh, could be pretty much like a sorting algorithm. So maybe if you guys have ever heard of bubble sort or insertion sort or selection sort, which are sorting algorithms that, since it's bounded by O of n squared, are actually pretty good at a small level, right? Like if I have two or three elements, uh, it's going to be pretty good because I'm going to have, you know, two or three squared. It's going to beat out some of these other kind of... Um, sorting algorithms that are used more on a quick, uh, on a better scale, like quick sort and merge sort on a larger scale. But at those small elements, yeah, the small number of elements is going to be, it's going to be better actually. Um, cubic yeah, polynomial, again, I, I feel like at this point, um, they all kind of describe the th same thing. They're just growing faster, right? And they're bounded by things that grow faster. The one thing that I would make a note of is this O of n factorial. Um, anything that has factorial time, you, you usually see something that had like either maybe polynomial or exponential or even factorial time in the sense of maybe like a backtracking algorithm or literally having to like compute the factorial for each element you have in the uh, in your input. Something like that would be just crazy. But yeah, that would be an example of something that's bounded by like n factorial, for example. And again, what we had said before was when we analyze um, these best average and worst cases, again, looking at worst the most often, we'll, um, we'll look at omega for best, theta for average, and then big O for the worst case. Again, we're going to look at the worst case. Any questions, by the way, just to stop before I uh, keep going on, because I know um, I, I tend to kind of just talk uninterrupted. No? Okay, cool. So space complexity, um, you know, <laughs> not too hard to derive from time complexity. Space complexity is defined as the amount of memory space required by an algorithm to solve an instance of a computational problem. Long definition, it's really just how much memory you need to run an algorithm. Um, again, it's also parameterized or characterized by these big omega, big theta, and big O for best average and worst case for an algorithm's uh, space complexity. So before we actually switch from the slide to a couple of uh, functions or a couple of algorithms that I actually looked up that I want to show you guys, um, we're going to talk about how time and space interact with each other, right? Um, 
a lot in the industry and pretty much where anywhere, I don't know to the industry, anywhere where algorithms are used, whether it's a software developer trying to develop some backend process or algorithm for something they have to do, right? Um, or, you know, just maybe, you know, algorithms that work behind the scenes we never see that run, like, you know, um, different frameworks that we, we don't even know about. But the whole idea is that there's a trade-off between time complexity and space complexity generally. That's not always the case, but it, it's it's pretty interesting or a pretty general, pretty good to generally say that. So if I have an algorithm, for example, with uh, a time complexity of like O of N squared, right? Maybe it's a, to- a constant space complexity. Um, let's take uh, insertion for- source, for example, because I know that has O of N squared and constant space complexity. Um, I may be able to switch to a better algorithm, uh, maybe merge sort, which has O of N of N time complexity, but ramps up that space a little bit to worst case being O of N. You know, uh, so it's a trade-off, right? I get faster, uh, uh, you know, algorithm uh, running time, but I have to use more memory. So it really depends what you're doing. If I work in telecommunications, right? Maybe I'm a telecommunications engineer and I'm trying to develop, you know, um, some algorithm to kind of, you know, aid in the process of maybe using a cell phone, right? Uh, maybe even like on the hardware level, like, it, you know, it, it's key to have speed in telecommunication. It needs to be instant. So if I'm going to try to make a trade-off for space complexity, you know, I'm going to have to make it a pretty good trade-off because I don't want to sacrifice any time, really. Uh, well, as if I was in an embedded systems engineer, I could be working on a product or, or some kind of machine that has the smallest amount of you know memory you know any mocker machine has today. So I definitely value my space for uh, lack of a better term there. I don't really care too much about time. Maybe I would under certain circumstances, but generally no. So again, it's a trade-off, and what you're working on kind of defines what you're going to do to kind of reach your goals. Uh, I will make a note though, however, um, a lot of people do recommend. Um, I think in, in general, uh, in, in most aspects, that this trade-off isn't actually as big as it used to be because of the rate that we have been developing just larger and larger uh, memory sizes for systems, that it's literally just like, you know, you're comparing time, which are really, it's a lot harder to kind of develop systems that are, um, in comparison, of course, to space. The space just grows so fast that, you know, you're going to probably value time more often than not uh, when comparing it to space. So I'm going to whip out um, some Java examples. So I'm going to kind of minimize this and go to Java. So I have three algorithms here. Um, two of them search algorithms, or one of them search algorithms, I apologize, and two of them sorting algorithms. So I was alluding to insertion sort uh, before. And what I have here is just a static method that I have for insertion sort. And pretty much we can see if we look at this and we kind of walk through this, that it's going to have a time complexity of LN squared, and it's going to have a space complexity of L1 to be constant. So if we look at it, we take an array of, you know, um, maybe, sorry, size N, right? Maybe, Maybe it's length N. And we have this for loop here. So for... Time complexity, a lot of times people will look at these for loops and say, oh, you know, that's an O of N process, right? Because usually in a for loop, we want to iterate over a collection, a collection in this case being an array. So we'll say, oh, okay, that's a that's, a, that's an O of N process, right? But um, in another case, when we have a loop nested inside a loop, we'd kind of say as a natural heuristic, oh, that's probably O of N squared. Um, not always the case, but it's a decently popular heuristic that I've seen people use. I've used it and I know a lot of people do, so it's pretty good. And the whole idea about insertion sort is if you imagine yourself kind of having a deck of cards and you're pretty much putting each card in its place uh, from lowest to to greatest, and you pretty much work on one card at a time and move it either back or you keep it where it is depending on if it's uh, lower than the card to its left. So you can pretty much see it as all the small cards are going to be moved to the left one at a time, and uh, the big cards are going to just move past them, or they're going to stay where they are, and you're going to have a sorted array. So you can kind of see that in the code. Um, 
pretty much for i equals one you're going to go through here you're going to through the array and you're going to have uh while j does not equal zero and array j minus one is greater than the current which pretty much means that the left is greater than the current you're just going to be switching them until that's not the case so maybe array of one equals five and array sub zero equals two i'm not going to go after that right and it's going to do that for you know n minus one times um where n is the length i do want to say this for algorithms in general you do kind of want to have a, a proof in the way of like a recurrence and uh, i use the term recurrence pretty loosely here I'll, I'll type it out but um what a recurrence is is you pretty much kind of find this this function uh t of n which actually the the guy in the video was talking about i don't know if that was just a notational difference but you find this function t of n and you could kind of logically prove that an algorithm rather than just using our our kind of theorem uh, you can logically prove that a an algorithm has a certain time of complexity in terms of big o so moving down you know we have insert and sort it's fine it sorts lists whatever you know, it's n squared, but maybe we can do better, right? Uh, here we have merge and merge sort. Merge is just a, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through how merge sort works before I go into merge. So merge sort really works uh, on the basis of you pretty much have an array and you're going to use this, what we call divide and conquer algorithm, which is pretty much going to split the array in two and it's going to keep splitting the array in two until it's able to um, make it a very trivial problem where you're going to have an array of, uh, of length one, right? You're going to have an array of length one, and you're going to be like, oh, well, that obviously I just returned this array, right? Um, and then in that case, once you're done doing that, this is a recursive solution for that. Um, you're going to call merge up here. And what merge is going to do is going to use this pointer method, uh, which you can see over here with i and j and the index, and it's going to put this array back together in increasing order and it's going to keep doing that for all those sub arrays until it has the sorted array back so I, I like this idea too because you can kind of see where this time complexity comes from say you have a um an array of length and i might actually draw this out too because i think it might be a little more you know stimulating i guess for the mind than just kind of talking about it with you guys so say you say i have an array two nine eight and seven right just to make sure it comes up. I think it should in a second. I know OneNote's slow. If anything, I'll just reload that. You're not supposed to get you get out of there. There we go. Okay. So I have this array 2, 9, 8, and 7, and I want to apply uh, merge sort. So pretty much what I had said was I find like a middle point in this array. and split this array uh, based on the midpoint. So I have two and nine and all of eight and seven. And of course, recursion just keeps applying the same strategy onto smaller problems, subproblems. So I'm just gonna break this up into two and nine. The same thing with eight and seven, because it's just length two, midpoint's one, you get the idea, right? Um, here, I have these kind of smaller uh, trivial problems. So I'm just gonna go back up um, and pretty much use a kind of pointer method to sort these. So, you know, obviously two would come before nine, uh, seven would come before eight, and then I would have this, these two arrays of seven and eight, two and nine, and I would compare, uh, I would merge them uh, similarly. I would say, okay, use my pointer method and say two, seven, eight, nine, and then I'd get the array back where it's two, seven, eight, and nine. So that's how merge sort uh, works. And it's going to have, again, this time complexity of O of, sorry, yeah, O of N log N. And I always kind of found O of N log N to be a little confusing when it came to uh, time complexity or just complexity in general. But the idea is that you're pretty much doing N work, or you're doing log of N work N times, right? So you're splitting up these arrays pretty much N times. And then you, the act of splitting is log of n, right? So you're pretty much multiplying n times log of n. And that's where that result comes from. 
course, it's worst worst case, and it might not be that for each input, but you know, once you do the recurrence and everything I explained before, you would get that result, and you could intuitively see it saying, okay, if I took, you know, if I, I have I got bound it, right? That's the idea. So that is merge sort. So now we're going to go on to one more. And actually, sorry about that. Before I move on, I want to say one thing. Insertion sort at a constant uh, space complexity, right? So we really just looked at um, that one array. We didn't do much with it. We just kind of sorted it in place. And that's called the in-place algorithm, right? It doesn't use um, you know, extra memory. It uses the one memory, and it returns that one memory. Merge sort's different. It uses, uh, it has an O of N space complexity, which means it's generating those new arrays, as I showed you. Those aren't the same array. Those are different arrays which are generating of, you know, length N divided by two, depending on what you're calling uh, the, the method on or, you know, the, the original length. So that's a trade off, right? If I want to use merge sort for faster speed, I'm going to have to supply more memory. Uh, again, showing that kind of trade off between time and space. Binary search, um, something I, I feel like we don't talk that much about uh, in general is these kind of, uh, these, these search algorithms other than binary search. And, and I know introducing binary search is kind of, uh, it kind of defeats the point of saying that we don't really talk about it that much other than binary search. But the whole idea of binary search is you have some sorted list. So you can use merge sort or insertion sort again, sort your list and say, okay, I want to search for a specific value. Uh, this one that I've implemented just gives the array uh, index of that value. But the whole idea is that it's going to take O of log n time, and it's going to take uh, pretty much constant time compl uh, space complexity. So it uses that one array, and it just searches that one array, and run on one array, and pretty much finds the midpoint, similarly to merge sort, and really splits the array in half uh, depending on the value. So maybe I want 75, right? Take the midpoint, midpoint's 50, the midpoint is less, so I know I have to search in 51 to maybe 100, or maybe that's the, the array size I'm working with, I said 50. So I'm going to keep doing that until I find my value or I don't find it. Uh, I, I, it's not there. So, you know, this is different from merge sort. They both have a log n term, right? But with merge sort, you're splitting into n arrays. This one just has one array, not doing any splitting of any kind or merging of any kind. And, so it's going to be that kind of in-place, again, algorithm where it's going to have this constant uh, space complexity. So uh, any questions about that, too? Um, any questions also about binary search, uh, merge sort, insertion sort? Um, all pretty interesting algorithms. If uh, you want to know more about them, I'm fine to talk about them. Going once, going twice. Okay, cool. So I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Current slide. So here are some closing remarks um, about uh, algorithmic analysis and space and time complexity. So really in all aspects of uh, life, really, you're going to run into um, algorithms, you know, running into the background, you know, everyone's connected to the internet today, everyone's using some form of device, even the, you know, boomers that use, I don't know, <laughs> like, uh, freaking flip phones, but, uh, you know, they're using some form of algorithm, right? So the whole idea is that, you know, if we're running our whole world on these algorithms, we should know something about them. That's where an the analysis of algorithms come in. And especially us as either developers or scientists or, and engineers, you know, we want to be able to know about the algorithms that we use to achieve our goals and the algorithms that we develop. So this is a really big thing just to at least have a high level aspect of. Um, and the only way that we're going to have better algorithms is if we can analyze them, you know, compare them for better jobs. So we're going to produce better ways to do things. We have to compare these algorithms, how many resources they use, and try to strive to get better, uh, more minimized uh, time and space complexities for these algorithms. So that's pretty much the whole point of uh, time and space complexity. Again, I kind of didn't go into too full deep detail with this presentation. My hope is that you might uh, either already know more about that, or you might look into uh, algorithms and, and also data structures since they go pretty hand in hand uh, more deeply. 
But um, again, really uh, important topic, at least to know about um, for, again, developers, engineers, scientists, etc. So thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening, rather. And uh, here I have some links that I'll put in the workshop text for some supplementary materials and resources if you want to read about the topic itself. I myself find it interesting, even though I know it can be a bit dry, uh, especially when you see it in real life. I know those algorithm visualizers, but I'll also put a link to in the uh, workshop, can be really fun to play around with and kind of just see how they work. And, um, you know, again, they work everywhere and with everything you use. So, again, thank you for listening, and I really appreciate all you guys who stayed and came here. So thank you again, guys. Thank you, Matt. It was a great workshop. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it, definitely super useful to talk about this for anybody looking for new grad positions and internships, and also just very good to know <clears throat> in general because it can also help with your general programming skills. And um, what's also interesting to look into would be quantum computing because there are a lot of methods that are being studied to actually improve um, time and space complexities to in certain ways that we wouldn't be able to with no normal computing and we ha we had a quantum computing workshop last semester or sorry last year well, it actually might have been last semester but if anybody is interested in if anybody liked this workshop and is also interested in um, I guess the future then I would suggest looking at that workshop and I believe it's on recorded on YouTube um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing you, since you mentioned quantum computing uh, a lot of people themselves too would think that oh quantum computing that was some superior technology right in all the ways that it is superior uh, and I don't I haven't studied too in depth quantum computing but I have read about you know a few cases just like with time complexity and space complexity there are some algorithms that will initially do well there are algorithms on classical computers, i.e., you know, like your Turing machine, that actually outperform quantum computing methods. So for the majority of things, you know, quantum computing is like a powerhouse, but sometimes you really got to analyze this algorithm to see where they're actually performing well and not make any false assumptions. That's also interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I found it surprising too, but yeah, it just proves again you've got to know what you're working with, at least to some degree. Yeah. That was a good workshop, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, does anyone have any questions before I start asking questions? Before you lay it on us? Before I lay it on, uh, before I lay it on that? Yeah. No one? All right. So my first question is, what is the time complexity of the triangle algorithm? I would very much like to know what the time complexity of the triangle generating algorithm is. I don't know that offhand. I can search it up. We can. I, it's okay. It's it's very simple. It's the algorithm that prints out a triangle of star characters. So oh. I will. I'll share oh. screen and do pseudocode for it really quick. Star. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay, we could put up my little screen again. Hang on. Um screen or do you want me to put on I'll, I'll share my screen and just quickly write it up it's a double for loop algorithm yeah it is yeah. so it's effectively you have, you have to it's dependent on the size of the triangle i guess right yeah so you have something like four and i equals zero while i is less than and this is the number of rows in the triangle so let's say um this is the height of the triangle i I plus plus. And now the thing is, the inner for a loop is going to range over. Um, so then you have, I think it's going to be, most people do while j is like equal to zero, and then they have while j is less than or equal to i, j plus plus, and then print star. And then print new line. Something like this would be the triangle algorithm. So this generates a triangle of um, height. 
it's basically a square triangle, right, of height. So my it's assumption is that this right is polynomial triangle. time. That's but, the whole idea, right? What's it's, that? It's a, it's a right triangle where you're building the longest side, or I guess you're... It's long as well. it's but gonna it's, have it's gonna be like half of a square. It's generating like half of a square. Right? Yeah, exactly. So it's not like, like if you put in height is one, it's just gonna print out a single thing. If you put in height is two, it's gonna yeah, be exactly. this guy. If it's height three, it's gonna print out this guy. Height four, this guy, or maybe it would be one less. I'm not actually gonna do the math out, but no, I, you, I think you you're get right, the idea. Though, it's gonna print out like zero to one, or no, it might actually no, no, it's, it's less than or equal to. Yeah, we print out that zero to one. You're right. Okay, so effectively you're just generating a bigger and bigger triangle based on what this height is. The height is the both the width and the length. So, I mean, you could just call this size. But the question is, is this O of n squared? Or is this... It's still O of n squared. It would still be O of n squared. Make the argument for why this is O of n squared, because I'm never convinced that this is actually O of n squared. I, mean, I have last semester I have tried to I tried to argue that this was not O of n squared and Do you wanna prove it geometrically or do you wanna to try to prove it like just by looking at the code? Exactly I want to try and prove it because it's not based on O of n of the size. So what's the formula for how many of these get printed out well, each you, time? As you were saying you were printing out it was pretty much half of the square, oh because right? it's gonna be i mean if you do it geometrically it would be o of n divided by two right no o of n squared divided by yeah. two. yeah <laughs> yeah oh i don't like this this is polynomial time the yeah. geometric argument is actually really obvious yeah. i don't think i ever saw that until right until i looked at right now i was like oh shoot yeah. It happens. I uh, that, that's the idea. Just like, if, when you bring a problem to different people, they might have a different way of looking at. It. So like just looking cool. over the for loops, though, it's kind of hard because it's like, oh, okay, there's um this inner loop here that's not actually going up to n every single time, but still, even though the worst case is this, it simplifies to so n squared. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole idea, I guess, behind like some of this stuff and the upper bounds too, because like. Obviously, when I was talking about insertion sort and the whole idea of like, oh, well, you just, you know, maybe you have the case where, you know, uh, maybe it's an almost perfect, li almost sorted list, right? Uh, it, it doesn't really matter because I'm bounding it by the worst case. So right. The worst case is going to be n squared. So, I, I mean, at least pretty much. Well, like in this case, the worst case is never actually going to be n squared. You're never actually printing out n things. But like you you're never actually read. printing out n squared things, but your print worst case is always going to be this. But the simplification could, kicks. In, I, right? I think you could bound it by a big theta of n squared over two. Yeah, you probably could. Um, I mean, it's yeah, because you're always printing out n squared divided by two things. There is no worst case, right? It's always going to be this as its yeah, best so time as well. It's bound you, kind of, you kind of have like a standard, or you have like a normal distribution for your best, worst, and <laughs> best, worst, and average time. All I three. mean, no matter what you put in a size, it always takes n squared divided by two steps to run. Yeah, so, so. it's kind of constant on the way that it's dependent. It's really weird. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fun, yeah. That's a good one. Um, is it actually n squared divided by two? Like, if we actually made this out as a square, because you have to add the diagonal in as well. That's actually, the area of a triangle. It's one half uh, base times height squared, or yeah, and where you have an n by n. But if we're actually talking about number of operations here, we have to include the diagonal in as an extra size. So wouldn't it be n squared divided by two and then plus n? The diagonal, the, size. the diagonal as in like because the diagonal is always it's not a real triangle right because it's a chunky triangle right no, so if we're actually no. talking about the number of blocks here the diagonal counts as extra steps and it's going to be n I extra mean, steps to print it, it could oh, be, no right maybe i'm there. insane actually hang on if you put the Like, because if we have this, it's not, like, because the full size of the square is this, right? Yeah. But we're only taking out three 
and we're leaving six. So it's more than n squared divided by two steps for the actual polynomial of what's being printed out. You're what's the, a, what's the additional taking, constant we add on here? Or not constant. You're like taking the ceiling of one half n squared, right? Because if you have a nine, like you have their nine elements, you're pretty much saying, oh, well, it's five, but then it's, you know, 4.5, right? So you just take the ceiling of that, you have five. That may work. It's six. Normalize it, but... Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying plus n, because you're going to add on the extra amount of the diagonal. There's always going to be the extra height. But I don't think we're actually dividing by two now that I think about it. Yeah, you're going to have to do some kind of seal computation here. Or, so it would be, what, the four of n squared divided by two? And then I, this is actually an interesting problem I'd want to work out at some point. Like, what, how many steps actually happen every single time if we're bounding this by a real polynomial instead of yeah. the n squared. But we do know that in the end it's n squared. So yeah. that's that's all I wanted to that's all I wanted to see. I think an interesting way to do this would be to again use that whole idea of the recurrence uh, that I had described a bit before. Um, wherein you kind of use like a logical argument. They also do it by induction and stuff like that, if you want to get more math heavy. But um, you, you can kind of, I guess, use um, some of the logical, like, base logical findings to kind of prove that, kind of bounce it further and further until, I guess, you're sandwiched between something. I don't know. I um, It's an interesting idea. But, uh, Anyone, I challenge you to compute the actual polynomial for, not a, for how long this takes um, or how many steps there are. Basically, what I'm really asking is how many items are there in a how many filled items are there in a lower diagonal matrix but this isn't this is a fun question i like this um the other thing that i wanted to discuss beyond this algorithm was linear time sorting algorithm does anyone know of a linear time sorting algorithm radix 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 is log i'm pretty sure no, no it's not it's um I think it, it's it's k plus n or n plus k where k is the length of the longest. All uh, right, we're gonna look it to into radix sort. Oh, this is linear time, but it's always linear time, and and it's plus. What's the w constant? I actually haven't looked at radix sort in years. Yeah, it's also um, what's it called? Uh, it's also not stable, but it kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, I didn't talk about that during the workshop because we weren't really talking about the sorting as related to uh, um, object-oriented programming or any programming for that matter, other than just showing off the code implementation. But um, I think a good example is say I have a bunch of objects, uh, pretty much called like maybe student, and I give them a student ID, um, and I want to sort based on that student ID. Um, if I have a sorting algorithm such as radix sort. Uh, to try to sort those, I, I can't do it. Or at least I can't sort the people, objects attached to it, because what happens is uh, the way that radix sort works is you assume that you're only, uh, you only have like these number ranges. You don't have objects to, because it, it, it compares by one one digit. And like, if I remember correctly, like this kind of like this 2D matrix almost, if you think about it. And you're kind of just like moving the numbers based on that. So it's not like a, a sorting algorithm where you can take those objects, you take those 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 attributes of student ID rather, and um and, and sort them, and it'll it's will serve kind of like as an analog to sorting the people, right? You can't do that with radix sort, uh, so it's noted as unstable. Uh, While well, the rest of them that can do that, they can sort objects uh, that are attached, that have attachments such as numbers as stable. That's interesting. At what point, I wonder, does radix sort? What at what point does um like how many objects do you have to have? Or uh, let's go with numbers since it works better for radix sort. At what point would you be better off using something like um quick sort for sorting a list of numbers over um, radix sort? Where is the at what point does the key get so long that? Quicksort becomes the better option. 
I think you might run into a decent amount of system issues, like memory issues, before you... You're going to run into issues using anything over a 64-bit integer <laughs> immediately. But assuming you could and you had big, dumb Braidic sort, I'd be interested at what point. Like, I guess it would be the idea of having... Um, maybe you have infinitely long, and I say infinitely long just to try to make it as huge as possible. Uh, like a, a, a long numbers, right? So just like with infinite amount of digits, um, and maybe you only have like ten of those or two of those, and you just want to use. Uh, maybe you can compress or use a compression algorithm in such a way that you can just look at it. And it's not very lossy, and you can kind of just compare them. If you're to do it like that with merge sort or something like quick sort. Uh, yeah, you're you're fine. Uh, if you try to compare emo you know, element by element of those two numbers, that's just gonna be you know big O of infinity, which is really just not viable at all. So um, I, I guess that would be a theoretical case, um, but definitely a good idea. If it wasn't a theoretical case, I guess you'd probably just take the inequality of uh, the two, right? Of the two yeah. Times. So I think so. Tony, I think Tony was saying something about this before, but quantum computing. I think they have. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a square root um, complexity for sorting. That's interesting. I have to Which look is up more on kind of insane. I don't really understand how they would have that, but supposedly they you can sort in square root n time, where n is the number of elements in the list, which is kind of insane to think about i'm not i'm trying to remember if that's search or sort but it, it feels really counterintuitive that you could do a search or a sort in less than linear time i mean as you know again once you get up to like weird not even up because i, I i'm saying up it's not up but once you get into like you know weird dimensionalities and that everything gets a little uh a little yeah weird. Yeah, so maybe it's just something that you can't see, and it's just like, how does that happen? You're just like, oh, okay. Uh, All right, so I have I have the optimal. I don't know how many people have heard of this, but I have the optimal uh, sorting algorithm that runs in linear time every single time. I don't know how many people have heard of spaghetti sort. Has anyone heard of spaghetti sort? I've heard of spaghetti sort. I have not seen it. If you want to bring it up, let's maybe. talk about let's talk about spaghetti sort. So spaghetti sort. Um, let's say we want to sort the list of numbers. We have an array on our computer of four. Um, let's say five and three. So we want to sort this array. Now, how can we sort this array in linear time? Well, it's quite simple. Um, we program it so a robot will look at this and break off sticks of spaghetti in real life that correspond to the lengths of these numbers. So four is this guy right here. Five is this tall guy right here. And three is this short guy. Now the robot takes its hand and starts lowering their hand down. And when it touches the top of a piece of spaghetti, it selects that piece of spaghetti and lays it down and puts it in the list back in the computer to its corresponding number. So it finds five. Now it does this again. The spaghetti piece has been removed. It lowers its hand again, finds four, lowers its hand again, and finds three. And we have just sorted this list in O of N time. You know what's funny, too? I think that kind of algorithm, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll post it somewhere or talk about it. But that would be like stable in the way that you, I think you could attach objects to that and still sort them. Like, oh, absolutely. Like yes. This, these could have, um, you could represent it. Since we're, we have a map function that maps anything to a stick of spaghetti of some certain length, um, that runs in presumably constant time because the map function between a piece of spaghetti and an object does not depend on the list of this array. So it's as good as constant as far as we're concerned. So this is O of 1. The only thing... The space complexity of O of N. What's that? You do have the space complexity of O of N. And you have the space complexity of this literally requires real-life sticks of spaghetti. 
but here's what's actually here's what's actually going on here and here's the hack behind this is that the max function we're basically saying is constant time we're basically saying computing the maximum of a list of numbers is constant for this that's why this is that's why this is busted because normally in a searching out in a like a very naive search algorithm or sort algorithm you would take the maximum of a list of numbers and put it into the lit, the array right here we're saying oh well lowering the hand and selecting the tallest that's the max function normally max is o of n but in this exam but in real life the spaghetti example max is o of one and but you here's, here's you have like a, I would say you probably have a somewhat comparably terrible min algorithm. Yes, you could easily change this. So you move your hand up from the bottom and identify um, whatever the shortest one is. Or even better than that, you don't even have to make a min algorithm. You just reverse the um, order of the numbers. So you make the tall, you make the map map the tiniest thing to the longest stick. And there's your min algorithm. Oh and yeah, you can just take the the uh, the you can just put them, hang them off a ceiling to say. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> well, that still that would still would find the longest, but would that no? I mean, if you went downward, like if you were like like hanging onto it like a rope, and you had the three strung up to the top, and which one did you let go of first? Oh, which one did you let go of first? But then you'd have to have a person climbing each individual noodle. Yeah, you could just do some this is, of that. This is pretty funny. Nah, that, that's parallel, man. You gotta get some parallel. So you have your noodles hanging from the ceiling, and then each noodle has a little person climbing on it, and whoever falls off adds their noodle to the list of the smallest noodles. Yeah, that's, um, you know, it, it requires pretty much uh, you know, standard, uh, you know, old one time complexity, but it also... It does require some people to fall off noodles, but, you know. So, it's you have to make. what's interesting about this is, theoretically, this is actually implementable on a computer. Um, you could, so not on a traditional computer in the traditional sense. This is what they call a um, analog algorithm. Because, theoretically, you could simulate each of these as electrical signals um with varying strengths so instead of cutting out a noodle that represents each of these you would have this one be a certain number of volts so rather than digital it would be analog and then because it's analog you would be able to take the max of multiple signals you're combining in constant time i'm not an electrical engineer i don't really know the underlying way that this is possible but from what i've heard this would be the possible an O of N um, algorithm on an analog computer, which no one has really made yet. There have been a lot of um, forays into analog computing and a true analog computer, but because of the fuzziness and wobbliness, uh, digital has always been the um, primary <laughs> computation platform. But I, I see no reason that they couldn't make a special analog chip that has a max assembly instruction, and when you do max of an array, it sends it to the analog chip to compute in O of n, um, o of n time. Or, oh, constant time for the max, but for a sort, then you could do O of n as long as you would have an analog chip available to compute it. Yeah, we gotta do a uh, uh, intro to integrated circuit workshop for just the mind. Oh, yeah, that would be really cool. Arduino Ryan, uh, Ryan. Uh, Brandon's freaking great with mine. Like he plays Minecraft all the time, and I was like, "Dude, I'll pull a blob of sim, and then we just implement it in Minecraft, and we'll have a workshop." <laughs> like, I wanted to host a workshop on um, uh, logic and logic gates and everything in Minecraft, but you know, I think that's an adequate reason to introduce Minecraft to a workshop. I think it's yeah. Really Reason. I don't have to host this, by the way. If anyone here wants to host that workshop, go ahead. I have other things I can give workshops Brandon on. Brandon needs to start hosting workshops. Let's convince him to do it. Brandon needs to host a workshop. Yeah, well, let's go sue Brandon. Get him to host a workshop. Let's just add him. <laughs> what? Add Brandon. Add Br I throw back to when I changed his name 
to yeah. hosting a workshop on the 8th of the month, and he did okay, it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Before this derails, is this meeting, is this presentation concluded? Well, I asked uh, all my questions. Does anyone else have any questions? Have my... Actually, that would be a better question, right? Anybody else have any questions before we leave? Anything you want to ask is fine. Um, I'll try to answer it to the best way as far as uh, complexity and algorithms go. All right, if not, uh, have a great night, guys. If you want to head out, you can head out. If you want to stay, free to stay. But uh, thanks for coming again. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks Thank for the you. workshop, Matt. All right. Thank you, Tony.